All right. Welcome to PatristaCast, everyone. This is the 25th episode of Scholars Forum. Happy, what day is it today? It's Friday today. Happy Friday, Friday everyone. Friday the 31st. Friday the 31st of March. Last day of March, and we still have a winter weather advisory here. And just looking uh, at Ioannis's screen there, it looks pretty pretty depressing in England as well, the weather. Well, you can see the the raindrops um, against against my window, and it's been it's been like that all day. I'm afraid. Makes me want to go to a sunny beach somewhere. <laughs> well, on this I, episode... wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to that at all. <laughs> I, I, we should we should have met in 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 California or Florida instead. That that's correct. We can dream. <laughs> well, today I am uh, very delighted to welcome do, uh, Dr. Johannes Zachuber, who is professor of systematic and historical theology, Trinity College at Oxford University, and he. Dr. Zakuber has published numerous articles and books in the field of patristics. Today, we are going to talk about a recent contribution of his. That's, there we go. Now you can see it. Christian Theology and the End, The Rise of Christian Theology and the End of Ancient Metaphysics. Dr. Zakuber, welcome to Patristicast. Thank you for joining me. John, thank thank you so much for thank you so much for having me. Well, this book, um, no, I should uh, confess a little bit here that when I, as a student of patristics, and and whenever we would get into trinitarian and christological debates, I would get a migraine headache because it's so complicated. There are so many people involved. The debates are highly nuanced. It's tough to follow. And your book is 300 and some odd pages of kind of getting into the nitty gritty of these debates. And aside from your ability to summarize the debates and the people involved, but to highlight their contributions, their unique contributions, I do have to say another benefit of your book is that as somebody who does these YouTube interviews, which I hope to turn into podcasts at some time, it's always nice when the author provides a very short statement that really gets at the content, like what the book is about. So I'm going to start with a quote. This is the opening sentence of chapter two, and this will springboard our conversation. Quote, in the final decades of the fourth century of the Common Era, the most influential philosophical system in the history of Eastern Christianity was created. Dr. Zakuber, speak a little bit about what this philosophical system was and who were the figures that contributed to its rise. Well, thank you. Um, well, we're talking the the answer the answer to the to the second question is the easy one, right? I mean, we're talking about the so-called Cappadocian fathers, or we're talking about a, a Basil of Caesarea, who in many ways kind of went ahead and was the sort of figurehead for that movement. Mm -hmm. We talk about his friend. I mean, it's a complicated friendship, but his friend, uh, nonetheless, Gregory Nazianzen, and then Basil's uh, Basil's uh, sort of younger brother, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, and and Gregory of Nyssa, I think in put in particular applied a major role for uh, what what I what I call this this philosophical theory now when we're talking about these three people what we see in the first instance is a group of people who brought to an end um uh, one of the most painful episodes in the doctrinal history in the church history really of the of the Eastern Church, perhaps of the of the of the Church in general, um, namely the the, the so-called Trinitarian controversy, mm. um, which for a long time, um, a long time, many decades, uh, brought uh, brought about divisions between different parts of the Church, between different individuals. Um, the the uh, the Council of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council ever in three hundred twenty five, had produced a, a statement of faith, but that initially um, um was more divisive than than unifying so interestingly um it 
the the church somehow managed to pull itself together and i think i think that's that's perhaps more worthy of being um, being being emphasized and people often often realize and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that that later on but in this case the church really managed to pull itself together in the end um and by the end of the fourth century we can i think um by and large say that this controversy was over and certainly when we look at uh, eastern christianity the fact that it was over um was largely due to these three theologians and when so when i when i say they produced uh, 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 ideas that were uniquely influential i think the uniqueness of the of the perception of these three theologians in the later eastern tradition has a lot to do with the sense that they actually managed to pull this off that they really are were were a, sort of an example for the ability to use ideas to use theology to find language to find a formulae to find concepts that could bring people back together so that's 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 why uh, that's why they 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 matter that's why they were seen and and i think continue to be seen as so as so be important and in influential now the other thing i need to explain is the as the presence of the word philosophy in the sentence oh, that yes. you that you've just quoted so up until now i've said they managed to somehow find language that resolved the other uh, debate um, about about the doctrine of the trinity but what i want to specifically to highlight in my in my book is that while they were doing that they also developed um a, a kind of a kind of formal language a, 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 a kind of logic but ultimately really also a kind of ontology a, a, an, an understanding a philosophical understanding of the nature of things that they used to make plausible the particular um, doctrinal language they they sustained uh, or supported and 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 pioneered and so my the purpose of my book is really to look at to look at uh, to look at this 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 patristic philosophy so what is it it's it's so in a way I, I i i'm interested less in telling a story about the development of doctrines and more in explaining how people tried to underwrite these doctrines and how people tried to find definitions for terms that could make sense of doctrines in the particular way they were um, articulated and 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 i think that that's at the end of the fourth century um, um a, a relatively new ambition and the cappadocians were um influential partly not just because they brought to an end this doctrinal conflict but also because in doing so they created a terminological and conceptual a system that seemed to provide a kind of intellectual backbone to christian theology and as such didn't didn't only didn't apply only to trinitarian theology but could also be applied to the doctrine of creation the doctrine of redemption uh, even eschatology and so we get almost something like a vision of a of a of a systematic theology where a relatively small number of of theoretical assumptions allow a people to show how all these different uh, doctrinal topics are related and how there's a particular way to think about them um, correctly. So you brought up a number of uh, essential aspects of this history. One is the, the Council of Nicaea, 325, uh, convened in a small little village right outside of Constantinople. Um, it, the fourth century was arguably the most turbulent period in Christian history, aside from maybe the 20th century. Um, it, it begins with this the great persecution under Diocletian, and it ends with the Origenist controversy where you have monks uh, chasing each other out of Egypt. And in the middle, sandwiched in the middle, are these Trinitarian conflicts, which got pretty nasty at times. Uh, <laughs> Athanasius, what was Athanasius was... Um, 
exiled, what, three separate times, I think, two or three times he went into exile. And then, of course, the Aryans were also uh, pushed into exile. And so you're, you're arguing here that the Cappadocians were really instrumental in bringing an end to that conflict. And you say, so you, you have this uh, term that you say there, they kind of develop, you call it the classical theory, where they provide the conceptual language that will kind of provide the glue for Christian reflections on Trinitarian theology. What are some of these concepts that they develop? Um, obviously, we got the hypostasis. Um, Westerners will recognize consubstantial as we recite the creed. Um, uh, one in being with the Father, uh, homo ousion in Greek. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about some of these okay. uh, concepts that they bring in and what are... You link it a lot with Aristotle and his categories, correct? And how language reveals or reflects reality. Bring if you could talk a little bit about that, that's quite fascinating. Well, absolutely. And I mean, um, so where where should we where should we start? So the so the Council of Nicaea had defined um that the sun um is of the same substance, as you said, homoousios with the father. Now the I'm 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 not going to go into that in any detail. I mean, there's a huge scholarly literature on what exactly was meant at the Council of Nicaea by using that term. And the simple answer I would say is that nobody knows, and we may never know because there's actually just so little. Um, there's so few sources that that apply directly to the Council of Nicaea. But it doesn't really matter for what I want to say because mm -hmm. by the time we come to the end uh, of the of the fourth century to the 360s, 370s. Um, um, that's that's the period in which uh, Basil uh, and the two Gregories were active. The way the controversy is usually um, understood is that um, there are those who support the language of Nicaea and the the, the use of this term of the same substance, mm -hmm. bringing father and son, potentially the spirit as well, in in a in a in a very very close uh, a relationship uh, to each other, and then there is this tradition that actually goes back to to origin, which insists very strongly on the separate reality of each of the three uh, trinitarian persons, and to emphasize this separate reality, they use the term hypostases or hypostases, mm -hmm. and. You know, if the, the kind of brief textbook account of what the Cappadocians accomplished is to say that they said there's a there's a simple way we can all agree on Nicaea. But if we say that the Trinity is a single substance, a single essence, a single usia in Greek, mm -hmm. uh, which exists in three persons, in three hypostases. Um, one and three and three and one. That's the kind of Trinitarian language that afterwards became common currency, um, actually both east, east and uh, east and west. And the and the idea is, you know, this this was a language that could could be understood um, as 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 a sort of or it could be the basis of of a consensus between east and west. Now, one big problem with this language was, um, what does it actually mean? For God to be to exist in this particular way, to be three hypostases and one is this is this just is this just uh, empty rhetoric or does it does it mean anything? Now, what Basil of Caesarea does, um, and you know, was it stroke of genius or was it the exact opposite? <laughs> he introduces in a number of very influential texts and letters. He was a very sort of he was a kind of networker, really, as we mm -hmm. would say today. Mm -hmm. Sort of wrote to many many people. Um, as part of it, his attempt to bring um, the church together again. So in some of these uh, letters, he explains how he understands this concept or how he thinks it should be understood. And he draws the, the he draw, uh, draws a, um, a, a parallel between the Trinitarian language of one substance and many uh, three hypotheses by saying, well, in a way, it's not so different from the way uh, we use it in created reality so for example we say that there are 
three individual people, um, Jack, John, um, uh, Jack, Peter, Andrew, um, and they're all human. And in so far as they're all human, they have their humanity in common. Uh, but in so far as they're all individuals, they are um, and they they are one. And why does why does he? Oh, 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 why does Basil say that or how does he mean that again? I mean, it's 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 a bit of a controversial issue, but in the first instance, and I think it's really not trivial to say that, um, he would say, um, it's we're we're talking about predication. And this is this is why, this is why, in my view, Aristotle and in particular his his short book, The Categories Matter. So Basil Basil basically says, um, we we think about the Trinity, we think about Father, Son, and Spirit, and, and we can say all the terms, all the predicates that um, refer to their divinity are predicated of each of them in exactly the same way. So if we say, if we say um, that the deity is, 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 is omnipotent or is eternal or is, 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 is perfectly good, then we can say that about Father, Son and Spirit. So the Father's eternal, the Son's eternal, the Spirit's eternal um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're, we're talking about predicates that are shared by all three of them, but then we have predicates that are not shared. Um, so the father is the only one who is unbegotten, the son is begotten, and the spirit is breathed. So and so we have we have that scheme, and it becomes a matter of how um, how how predication works. And likewise, you would say, well, if we talk about humanity, it's exactly the same thing. Um, human beings are mortal, rational animals and we can see that equally of Andrew Peter and John um but then they then each of those individually has certain characteristics idiomata it's another key Greek term that 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 comes into the debate at that time and so we can also tell them apart now the reason the reason um, um Aristotle matters or at least that is my reading of it is that there is a common view um, in uh, which which Aristotle himself probably held, but which was, which was certainly held by by people who read him and commented on his works, uh, which is that if you have a class of that kind where um, predicates are set in with the same meaning univocally um, of of more than one subject, that implies that the that the individuals are ontologically coordinated they are they are kind of at of the same rank and i think that this is somehow why basil found this model so attractive because by accepting that the the, the sort of predicate predicates that apply to deity are set in this way of all three persons the basic nicene tenet which is that there is no difference of no ontological difference no difference of ontological rank between father son and spirit um could be included in trinitarian language without kind of saying it explicitly um, um, all the time so that's that's at least one part of this theory now the moment you you know you could you could look at it as a kind of just an innocent way of drawing an analogy but the moment you look at the bigger picture you look at especially the way Gregory of Nyssa engages with a, a variety of doctrinal topics. You, then I think you can see that it's the it's the nucleus of a much more uh, sort of ambitious philosophical project because suddenly this idea of 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 being that is both one at an essential level, but it also exists in a plurality of individual of individuals, of individual beings, of individual hypostases, becomes a pattern that, that applies to the world in general. And so, and so what initially is just is just a formula to express Nicene Trinitarianism becomes also the the, the basis for a, a for a, for a sort of specifically Christian, specifically Nicene way of understanding the world and and being in general. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about Gregory of Nyssa? Because he he holds a special place in your book. You kind of link the the final the culmination of the classical theory in him. 
Basil kind of gets it started, but Gregory yeah. really solidifies it. Could you say a little bit more about that? I, I, absolutely. I mean, Gregory of Nyssa is kind of a really interesting character. Um, he's for a long time been in the in the shadow of Basil and and Nazianzen, but I think for the past fifty years or so, he's really emerged as a as a major figure in 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 his own right in the patristic period. And I think it's fair to say that among the three, Gregory really is the is the philosopher. He's the speculative thinker. You can see that he can't talk about any any topics a topic whether it's doctrinal or or whatever without somehow. Uh, um, um, a, a tagging on some sort of deep a speculative um, a reflection. Now, you know, one can speculate about how, whether he and Basil sort of discussed these issues while Basil was still alive. Basil died in, um, uh, in 379 or 380. Um, so really just when the world was sort of on the cusp of the general acceptance of the Nicene uh, faith um, and Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nyssiansen were the two people to sort of carry it over the line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and Gregory of Nyssa became sort of really only came into his own uh, in in the years after after Basel's death, which is a sort of complicating factor if we want to understand mm -hmm. how uh, uh, their works are related. Is Gregory doing things that Basel perhaps wouldn't have been happy with, or is he really just um, executing uh, things that he had possibly discussed with Basel at an earlier point in time, we just don't know. But the reality is that that what that uh, that what I just sort of um, what I just suggested, which is that this this kind of very simple uh, these this very simple formulaic language that Basel proposes to resolve the Trinitarian um, conflict in Gregory of Nyssa gets. Uh, developed in a way that is that is much more much more ambitious that that is th th there's a there's a clear sense that this idea of of a of of an of an equal uh, of of three equal individuals that somehow share being in common and jointly constitute the trinity is 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 applicable to a world and you know here we have to look at Gregory's interpretation of creation where he also wants to say well it is somehow similar because God creates uh, the world as one God himself is one so creation is actually complete at the at the moment it's it's of of its of its inception but at the same time creation really exists in individual beings and so and so we can we can find in creation itself these sort of two dimensions of of unity and of plurality and they're both kind of equally um valid and equally important and equally um um, um, um legitimate and so um I mean, one way of saying, I mean, you know, how is that new? How does it matter? Why did why why did it become so influential? One could say is it it is it is a break from a model that's been very influential in the Platonic tradition, for example, is also I think very important in 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 origin, mm -hmm. uh, which which I, I I know you you've studied, um, where the idea is much more that there is that there is. A sort of unity at the at the apex mm -hmm. um and then plurality is kind of derived from unity um and so even though again you don't have to end up being a gnostic and say matter is bad or you know the uh, sort of plurality as such is a, is, is a fall mm -hmm. uh, or is, is an is an accident it, you know you can't really deny that in general unity is better than plurality yeah. and 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 i think one one way to to see how um the cappadocians and gregory of nyssa in particular sort of use the trinitarian idea to create something new is to say there really isn't really isn't that idea of a of of, of a plurality that's kind of derived from unity and which therefore is ipso facto um, ontologically less less valuable. You can't really say that because the three hypostases in in the deity are 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 the apex. I mean, there isn't they are one substance, but the one substance isn't a kind of 
point above the three hypostases. Yeah. And so there is there's really a different a different sort of vision of being in the world where oneness and multiplicity are more like two poles that are that are both necessary for us to understand the world, but there isn't really a sense in which one is sort of less valid or less legitimate than the other. Mm-hmm. You know, while I was reading your section on this uh, i'm going to go in a little digression here but there's i don't know if you're familiar with the um uh see a historian of science or a philosopher of science from cambridge uh, university stephen meyer he has a a new book um called the return of the god hypothesis and so he enters into these debates with the the so-called new atheists you know um the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, Lawrence Krauss. And uh, I haven't read the book yet, but I've heard him talk about it. And one of the arguments he made is that um, in the 20th century, it was discovered that the universe is ever expanding. It keeps getting bigger. There's more stuff in it. And he says, you could take that, knowledge and if you work back in history you'll find that the universe was such and such a size smaller you know 500 years ago or a thousand years ago and you keep going back you can't do that infinitely there's no infinite regress so at at one point you have to um end up at this single simple unity where there before plurality that kind of got me this this idea of unity and plurality in Gregory and the Cappadocians got me thinking about that because it it really does there is sort of a problem how do you how do you defend God as a simple substance a unity when you have all this diversity and plurality and so your argument here I think quite interesting is that the Cappadocians and especially Gregory provide the framework for understanding just how that relationship works. And they use this analogy of, uh, uh, you you mentioned it earlier, that we have um, man, human uh, humanity, but then they're individual humans. They all share that same substance, the same nature, humanness, but then they have their own individual identities as well. And that was a contribution, you think, from the Cappadocians. Yep, exactly. Sorry, is that is that a question? Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that was a question. There is an implied uh, question mark in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it no, provides no, a helpful no, way of no, thinking ab- about the ab- problem. Absolute, sorry. No, no, ab- ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I think what's um you know what well, what's important is that these individual people are kind of they're basically all at the same level. And and I mean, of course, you can then uh, sort of ask questions. Again, if you, you just want to jump into our own time, and it's kind of often, you know, people have said that Gregory of Nyssa, interestingly, is one of the very early people who, fund, I mean, who reject slavery on principle, yeah. right? I mean, there is a, there is an idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a fundamental equality of human beings insofar as um, they are as individuals, Mm-hmm. all sort of on this on the same plane and and i mean i like this i i, I have to admit that i hadn't hadn't come across my other work but I, I i like i like um your your comparison there because it is true i mean there is there is a kind of idea of a kind of idea of evolution in in uh, gregory of nissa's mm-hmm. um understanding of of the trinity but it's it, and it's really it's really important i think that though at least the way i understand it it's important sort of both that there is a single point from which it starts and in some ways again because god creates immediately a perfect world right because how else could we understand it? it's not as if god needs not like you know you or i writing a book and we need a lot of time and only by the end it's ready and even then it's not perfect mm-hmm. um <laughs> uh, yep. so with god it's different right i mean he 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 completes what he what he what he does immediately but at the same time gregory wants to see the the, the sort of history um that uh, uh, reaches from creation to the restoration to the apocatastasis to the to the completion of of, of 
creation that history is still sort of real and it's it's not just a sort of virtual um a, a, a way we we kind of perhaps perceive that because we're unable to um take the the bird's eye view that that god has there is something essential about the about this about this evolution from from a from a from a single beginning to a sort of full fully developed a world in which the individual human beings but probably also i don't know the individual lions and sharks that mm -hmm. um were meant to exist have all really come um come come into being um uh, exactly the way they were uh, 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 their their existence was was sort of grounded in this initial um creation and so it is it is it is is, is evolution in the in the sense in which in which i think we ought to understand it in that the 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 development as such <coughs> i'm sorry mm -hmm. is is necessary and has has a has a has a definite value and okay, so one of the main arguments of your book is that these Cappadocians provide the conceptual language, the philosophy that guides subsequent Christian thought. However, a problem emerges, particularly in the fifth century, as the question shifts from the relationship between the Son and the Father to the incarnation itself and the human and divine nature in the person of Jesus. How, so this is quite fascinating. It's, it's very complex because you argue or you show that the different camps, the Chalcedonian uh, Orthodox and the Myophysites kind of want to trace their intellectual patrimony back to the Cappadocians they're both saying, you know, we're in line with what they were saying, and yet there's great conflict between them. Yeah. What happens to the classical theory when it encounters the Christological debates? You're, 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 you're abs absolutely right. I mean, in many ways, that that is that is the key moment in my in my book. Um, yes. And I think if somebody wanted to say that they get it completely wrong, and then that would be a good moment to to um, to to make that to make that case mm -hmm. so the way i see it, there are kind of two things that really matter one is that as as you've said the this this kind of cappadocian philosophy that we find specifically in in gregory of nyssa becomes i mean almost miraculously sort of accepted universally within really just a few years um after 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 it's been uh, conceptualized, after it's been developed, and so even even by the early decades of the fifth century, we find that people who are otherwise very very different, for example, um, Alexandrians such as um, such as Cyril of Alexandria on the one hand, and the Antiochians like Theodoret and Nestorius, they're all somehow operating in. Um, in, in an intellectual frame and in, in a terminological frame that is really determined by um by by the by the language and by the ideas of 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 the Cappadocians. So this 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 is a kind of koine, this is a this is a sort of general uh, lingua franca that is a, that's kind of presupposed and shared by by everybody. But the moment the uh, the the doctrinal problem that really needs to be resolved is Christology. Um, there is there is a big a big problem, and I I mean I realize that not everybody agrees with me there, but this is this is what what I think happens that the this this wonderful model that shows how the same oh. equally by three persons um, somehow gets people into trouble once they then say, well, you know, this has worked so well in the context of the Trinitarian controversy. Why don't we use that now to resolve our disagreements um, in Christology? Because 
by the end of the fifth century, by the beginning of the sixth century, it was clear to everybody that the Christological controversy was as bad and arguably worse yeah. than the Trinitarian one, and that the and that the hope of bringing people together became sort of flimsier uh, by by the decade. And inc incidentally, I mean. I don't know who's, who's watching this. And for some people, this may all be sort of very well known, but perhaps not to everybody. I mean, the big difference is that whereas we can say the Trinitarian controversy comes to an end pretty much yeah. by the end of the fourth century, I mean, the Christological controversy doesn't really come to an end. I mean, there is the Council of, uh, of, of Charles Sedan, 451, which for a lot of people in the West um, is seen as the point when this conflict is, is resolved. But um, but but in the East, it, it just it just goes on and on because because a, a lot of people, a, a, a large group of Easterners, um, and at some point in time, probably a majority of them, um, finds it impossible to accept the compromise of of of, of Chalcedon. And at the end of the day, I mean, in some ways, you see, in uh, I mean, an, an analogy I personally like is to see um, what happens is not so dissimilar from um the 16th century in in western europe oh, in that yeah. we have a we have a real breakup of of the of of the of this of, of christendom and by the end of the 6th century pretty much we have we end up with a, a separate communities with their own hierarchies um chalcedonians here myophysites uh, there and then the eastern syrians who you know, called Nestorians, but who don't under, uh, accept Chalcedon. They didn't even uh, accept the previous council of, of Ephesus. And so for the first time ever, Christianity experiences the absolutely painful reality that there is just no longer, there's no longer a community. And schism isn't just a sort of crisis where people break up, uh, break off com um, communion and then uh, and then it gets reestablished sooner or later, but it is fairly clear that this is now uh, this is now permanent, and 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 there's there's clearly a lot a lot of worry um, about about this about this development and these and these kind of philosophical um, philosophical story that I'm telling is is sort of embedded in this real sense of tragedy that these that these that these groups of Christians and in a way I think is really very similar. To the to the um, uh, Catholics and Lutherans and Calvinists in the 16th and 17th century, who also kind of live in the same place. They're kind of brothers sisters. They speak the same language. Mm -hmm. um, they 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 basically, you know, until very recently, they were kind of part of the same uh, part of the same church. And now they're kind of drifting further and further apart. And 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 there just seems to be no way to to stop that mm -hmm. um, to stop that from happening. Yeah. It you know, some people do think that Chalcedon ended the conflict, but it, I mean, it, it really didn't. And there were even some groups like the Armenians, I don't think were even at Chalcedon. Uh, I, I don't think they even knew about the conference being convened and also um, the Christians in India. So you got those kinds of groups that weren't even there, but then you have the groups that were there that didn't agree, that couldn't, yeah. just couldn't reconcile themselves with the compromise at Chalcedon and now these divisions even exist to today where a lot of Westerners don't realize how many different Eastern Christian churches there are that are not in communion with each other exactly I think I think this idea that Chalcedon is the end is a very Western perspective but we have to see that the Christological conflict in a way is an Eastern conflict and and I don't think there's a lot of evidence that you know people in the Latin world at the time even really cared about it um and uh and 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 they were very happy to sort of put this to bed with the council of, of uh, 451 which i mean there were many many reasons for for the latin west to like that council not least because it seemed to be the one case where the world um worked exactly as it should because the i mean the, the, the bishop of rome himself wasn't there uh, but he'd sent his emissaries and and they kind of spoke the authoritative word and somehow you know leo pope leo was 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 recognized as the 
as the as the person who inspired the solution. And of course, that kind of worked really well from a from a Western perspective because you would want to think that Rome is really the the uh, the, the the place where um, orth orthodoxy can be uh, decided. Um, but if the moment we're not looking at it from an Eastern perspective, even if we look at it from a sort of Greek Orthodox Byz Byzantine a perspective, um, I mean, Chalcedon is really um, uh, just um, it's it's just one um, event in a long chain of events and in a long chain of attempts to. Um, bring this problem to a resolution. And in some ways, we could say that perhaps the way the conflict, I mean, doesn't, I mean, you, it doesn't really get resolved because you're right, these churches exist to our, into our own time. It, it sort of stops being such a massively pressing issue, sort of ironically or, or sadly with the uh, Arabic conquest of the yeah, 7th century, that's, that's because right. after that, many or most of the territories where there's a where there's a large presence of non chalcedonians or sort of outside the empire and so they're kind of no longer the no longer the emperor's problem really and then and then the um greek church has other has other fish to fry and 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 later on the conflict between the latin and the greek church um takes center stage a bit the, the uh, about the about the uh, about the role of the spirit in particular um but but up but but it isn't it isn't even at that point it's not really a resolution it's really more that the the urgency of bringing people together is somewhat lessened by the fact that that it's that the political boundaries literally boundaries um have have shifted so dramatically uh, from the from the mid 7th century onwards and and in permanence of course so you brought up the Arab conquest, and now that is a vitally important historical moment. There's a couple of authors, a couple of uh, philosophers in your book that uh, were writing within that context, and we'll get to them. Um, you've, you've brought up Cyril of Alexandria, kind of a shrewd uh, politician in many ways, Nestorius. So before we wrap up, um, how about uh, a few words about some of the other figures that play out in your book. You've got Severus of Antioch and John Philoponos. Um, I, I like Philoponos because uh, Origen called uh, Ambrose, his patron, uh, a Philoponos, a, a lover of labor. <laughs> and then he he kept saying, you know, that Ambrose keeps pushing me to do all this stuff. I don't have time for anything because he keeps harking on me. Uh, so John Philoponos, the lover, or John the Grammarian, um, what, say a, a few words about these two uh, figures that emerge in your book. Yeah, I mean, when you you see, uh, I mean, one one thing before I answer your question directly, but one one sort of perhaps slightly provocative thing, or perhaps um, yeah, about a slightly provocative thing. You said you said earlier that you know the fourth century is a sort of uniquely troubled troubled period, and mm -hmm. and and now of course it is. It is somehow for people who study patristics today, the sort of golden period is really yeah. at the center of, of of people who study study patristics. You could say perhaps in the early into the early fifth century with figures like Augustine uh, and 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 Cyril. Um, but by and large, we're really talking about about really just a bit more than a century. I mean, what I what I've come to see is that even though we know so much less about the time and even though for reasons that i don't even fully understand we don't care seem to care so much about this time i mean the sixth century is equally fascinating actually it's equally troubled yeah. it has i mean if already said it is the it is the first time the christian church breaks into parts into more than you know it, there is it's the first permanent schism in the history of christianity i mean that is that is really a lot and it has produced a, a, a large number of very interesting individuals, but also a large number of highly, in my view at least, um, uh, sort of fascinating uh, theological theological debates. And yet, you know, very very little is known about them. So yeah. that's that's just kind of my 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 yeah. my sort of uh, headline a statement about that time. Now. One of one of the perhaps surprising things, again, perhaps a bit counterintuitive, because we think in terms of orthodoxy and heresy, obviously we think Chalcedon is the is the red, I mean, is in a way 
pointing the right way. And then there are some some sort of um, um, opponents who are still there. But I think that if we look at the sixth century, at least the early decades of the sixth century, what we find is that the opponents of Chalcedon, and um, the, the so-called Miaphysites, because they really insist that in order to speak of the incarnate, we need to use the term one nature, that I think the have very good reasons to think of themselves as the orthodox um, group. And, and one reason is that if we just look at the intellectual caliber of people who support that um, reading, uh, I mean, that's, it's it's just, it's clearly the intellectually uh, most impressive people of, of, of that generation. And, 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 and Severus of Antioch, is definitely is definitely one of them. Is definitely one of them. If we just for one moment bracket um, questions of orthodox heresy and simply just try to look at sort of significance stat stature, I would say you know you have Cyril of Alexandria in the fifth century. You have Maximus confessor in the seventh century, and the only one between these two who is really um, on a par with those two, I would say, is, is Severus. I mean, that's, that's I think, how we should see him. Um, and really, like, a sort of classical church father we have uh, from his pen, we have sermons, he wrote biblical commentaries, he wrote polemical writings. He, In a way, he is the one person from that time who kind of resembles the sort of Basil or Athanasius or Cyril in the in the breadth of his of his his production, um, but of course from sort of our point of view, because at the end of the day we're all Chalcedonians, he's kind of on the wrong side, and so at some point uh, the Emperor Justinian um, 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 orders all his writings burned, and so the the only reason we actually still have a lot of them is because they were translated into Syriac. Um, but then again, you know, not many people read that. Yeah. Uh, and so he's still sort of occupying a place on on the margins. But he's he's a he's a hugely impressive figure. And and he is he is definitely the one who works out something of, you know, what we might want to call a Myophysite orthodoxy. This is he's doing for the Myophysite community, perhaps what what Basil and Gregory of Nyssa did for the for the for the Nicene community in the fourth century. He did he develops a, a system of terminology, a system of of, of 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 sort of basic doctrinal, but in my view, also philosophical answers to key questions. He tries to show how the sort of patristic tradition up until that time can somehow be integrated into this vision of a kind of anti-Chalcedonian form of um, um, of, of 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 Christianity. So that's that's Severus, very fascinating figure still not well served by literature and people don't read him a lot because because he's his works are trans and they're all published right but they're transmitted in a language that very few people study so john philoponus the other one you asked about i mean he's kind of very very different he's 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 also uh, an an exceptional figure once again on the side of the myophysites but he's very different i mean John Philoponus is, is 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 not a bishop, right? I mean, he's really by training a philosopher. He is uh, he's he works in the philosophical school of, of of Alexandria, and and he is he's part. If you study the the history of late ancient um, um, philosophy, Philoponus is part of that. He writes as as philosophers do. He writes commentaries on Aristotle's writings, but he is also um, highly active in the theological debates of the time. And one really interesting thing about Philoponus is he comes along as someone who says, well, I have really, I have a kind of philosophical um, competence that nobody else has. I mean, he was definitely not lacking in self-confidence. Um, <laughs> I have a philosophical competence that nobody else has, and I can really show you how these things uh, will work out. Um, at the same time, he is, and perhaps that's kind of how many philosophers are, kind of um he really likes controversy he really likes provoking people so he starts out as somebody who tries to build bridges he writes a, a, a book he calls the the uh the arbiter um where he tries to find a way um in which um the the myophysite Christ, a, a version of Christology can perhaps integrate some truth 
um, that is also found among Chalcedonians. But then he becomes more and more confrontational. He is one of the he's one of the advocates of of a, of a really peculiar um, a doctrinal view that again strangely emerges at the time, which is is called tritheism. It's a kind of it's it's a it's 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 a way to sort of reopen the trinitarian debate um he he's also notorious for advocating views about the resurrection of the body that that were at, um were shocking to practically everybody uh, regardless of their um of their theological or ecclesiastical allegiance so so philoponus is a, is is really is really a funny and a, a sort of quirky person um, once again, I mean, on on the on the theological um, side of his of his of his work, there's there's even even now actually actually very little. But they are they are both Severus and Philopon. I would say people worth studying more, worth um, discovering, because there we have we have a f fascinating, learned, but also very thoughtful. Um, um, thinkers in sixth century Christianity, Eastern Christianity. So <clears throat> it occurred to me um, there might be some people who eventually watch this who don't know the term myophysite, or single nature, one nature. So we should kind of clarify just briefly Chalcedon, the compromise is two natures, human and divine. You bring up that term, the, the double homoousion. Where the divine nature is of the same substance with God, the Father, the human nature is of the same substance with human nature. And uh, the response of the non Chalcedonians is this one nature Christology, the single nature Christology, not the two natures, not the human and the divine. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, those are two really interesting. I think you know, it, it had occurred to me that that was perhaps a little <laughs> sort of in, inside baseball. <laughs> no, it. Uh, I don't know who watches. Uh, I'm not really sure um, uh, if it's mostly scholars who watch or not, but always nice to clarify when we can. Um, okay, so those those are the, the interesting figures of the Myophysite camp. Then we get into some more well-known figures, more well-studied figures. Uh, Maximus the Confessor mm -hmm. and John of Damascus. Can you say a few things about them? Uh, and then maybe we can uh, wrap up a little bit here. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I somehow feel. I mean, I don't feel I've had a massive load of new stuff to say about Maximus, and that's partly perhaps because of what I knew and what I had to say, but partly also because, really, compared with the people we've talked about a minute ago, I mean, Maximus actually has been served really well by by scholarship, certainly. Certainly, over the past thirty years or so, um, he is now recognized by many uh, patristics people, but I would say more broadly by theologians um, as a as a highly original figure uh, in the in the uh, uh, towards the end of the of the patristic period. I mean, I, I'd I'd love to talk a bit more about Maximus because, in some ways, he is an he is an incredibly interesting person in a way. Of, incredibly controversial he lived through this period of time <laughs> again i mean you know we're talking about turbulence right mm -hmm. when within a few decades um centuries of roman civilization just disappear yeah. and uh and the and, and you can really see how the emperor in in constantinople is sort of <laughs> sorry desperately trying to finally build bridges with the um, with the doctrinal opponents, really bring back a unity of of the um, of, of of Eastern Christendom, and they find a compromise by saying, "Okay, um, we accept. You know, people have to accept that uh, the Council of Chalcedon said Christ is one person in two natures, but perhaps we can build a bridge towards the." my emphasize the people who really want to say there's only one nature by saying that there is only that the two natures are united in one energy or later they say this one will and it's very clear that this this idea of, of of bringing in the one energy and one will kind of desperate attempts by uh by 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 a country that 
fights for its survival, really, to at least sort of rally around uh, the religious groups um, um, uh, at, at that time of need. <laughs> and yet yep. Maximus Maximus is, is, is a sort of intransigent, right? I mean, he says no, he goes to Rome, he uh, works with the, with the Pope, um, um, who obviously at the time is no, I mean, Rome isn't part of the, a uh, part of the, of the Byzantine empire. Mm -hmm. uh, so he kind of, you could say works with a foreign agent. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, he's, he's really, he's really a, a pain in the neck for, <laughs> for the, for the, for the, I mean, the, the patriarch in Constantinople, the, the, the emperor, I mean, uh, he's, he's, he's giving them a very, very hard time. Yeah. Um, um, in, in that sense, really a bit like Athanasius it's it's oh. a clear sense you know this is we have to stand up for what's dogmatically true and for uh, Maximus it's totally clear that this language of one uh, energy or one will is ultimately betrayal of Chalcedon. and so he is a real and, and you know he ends up then practically being martyred he's a, he's a martyr for mm -hmm. uh for um um um, um uh, for Chalcedon really for the Chalcedonian cause um uh, and so, so I'm, um, you know, he's a he's a uniquely uniquely interesting, uh, he's a uniquely interesting individual, a uniquely interesting interesting person. But he is also a real giant of in intellectual achievement, and 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 the way I, I try to show that towards the end of my book is by saying, you know, here we have someone who has a vision of, in a way, moving beyond this almost sort of fruitless. A controversy um, over, um, you know, one nature, two natures that that has that has sort of occupied people for 150 years. Maximus, in a very innovative way, basically really reaches back. He goes back to the Cappadocians. He goes back, in particular, to Gregory Nazianzus. He he also uses a figure I I don't discuss a lot in my book, but who kind of appears mysteriously on the scene at the time. The so-called Dionysius the Areopagite, yes. yeah. written a, a number of writings composed apparently in the late fifth century, but pretends to be an apostolic writing from the first century. Maximus creates really an, an original um, 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 Chalcedonian synthesis um, based on um, 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 in influences from from Dionysius from the Cappadocians uh, and, uh, and 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 even in a way um, the, the 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 originist tradition mm -hmm. um, to the extent that was possible after after origins condemnation mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in the in the sixth century. Um, so, so I mean, Maximus is just a giant, and in some ways, he is a he is he puts he he continues these debates, but at another level, I see him as someone who also really opens up a new chapter in the history of Eastern theology. Actually, also a, a bridge to a bridge to the West, not only personally in his in his work with the Bishop of Rome, but also as someone. Um, at least some of whose work gets actually translated into Latin uh, pretty soon after his death, and I think you know keeps keeps influencing um, um, a later Christianity, um, like really few other of these later figures. And then uh, John of Damascus, uh, uh, someone who uh, lived in the Caliphate. Um, what what's his contribution? Because Thomas Aquinas, I think. In the 13th century, John of Damascus is one of his most absolutely uh, cited sources outside of Augustine and Aristotle, and um, well, of course, Scripture. But John of Damascus. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody can deny that. So John of John of Damascus again is a kind of interesting figure, although unlike in the case of Maximus, we hardly know anything for certain. Mm -hmm. I mean, he lives uh, under the Caliphate of Damascus. Um, but but about his about his person about his personal life we we have we have very little reliable information. Um, he his his main contribution is the creation of a number of writings that, that you know we might say is almost a bit is a bit encyclopedic. In that yeah. sense, I would say rather different from Maximus. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a debate which is still going on in scholarship about whether John of Damascus is innovative at all or whether he's just a compiler. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I personally think that he's more original than than people give him credit for, but I don't think there's any doubt that if we take Maximus here and John of Damascus there, that by comparison, John of Damascus, is his, his main concern is not to open new debates, but really to provide, you know, in my view, he provides for a Chalcedonian community that's now cut off from the uh, Byzantine Empire, the resources to sort of reorganize their church and an entirely different uh, political and, and 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 social framework. So that's that's what we have what we have in 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 John of Damascus. Now, what you say about Aquinas is totally true, and it's not just true for Aquinas, but for the Middle Ages, and in fact for early modernity as well. Um, John of Damascus' main work. Um, or often called on the on the Orthodox faith, yep. um, gets translated in the 11th century, um, and then immediately gets picked up in uh, by by Peter 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 Lombard, mm -hmm. um, and Peter Lombard later on is the main um, uh, the the main authority for practically all um, scholastic debates mm -hmm. in. In, in the in the in the high and later Middle Ages and and so via via Peter Lombard, uh, John of Damascus kind of enters the bloodstream of of, of, of Western scholastic uh, theology, and 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 it is I mean it is actually really relevant for my topic because the main reason people like Aquinas um, um, find find John of Damascus important is because they get the technical, and you said earlier, kind of gets really technical, really complicated. The technical Christology, mm -hmm. which in fairness, you don't really have in Augustine, because yeah. Augustine writes before the Christological controversy. Mm -hmm. There is no real Latin author um, in the in the early Middle Ages, right. who are perhaps Boethius to an extent, but even, even Boethius doesn't really offer that. So what you get in John of Damascus is, is a sort of sophisticated form of technical Christology, unlike anything you would have in a Latin source. And for that reason, he is he is absolutely key wherever people um, try to articulate Christology. So here's the big irony. Um, at one level, we think of the Latin and Greek developments in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century as being more and more separated from each other. I mean, you, you will read in the literature everywhere that, you know, fewer people knew each other's languages. Um, and I think that's true, um, the, the, uh, the, even though the schism happens uh, only in the 11th century, but... Um, there is there is a much uh, greater separation between the two early on, and yet I think it's fair to say that if we look if we look at later Western theology, whether that's Aquinas or whether it is the sort of early modern, um, I don't know Lutheran, Calvinist, whatever authors, um, it's arguable that the uh, that that there is no other period in 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 sort of Eastern uh, theological history that's as sort of impacts the Western development as strongly as the sort of post-Chalcedonian mm -hmm. Christology, mm -hmm. simply because, you know, for 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 Trinitarian debates, Western authors will always somehow rely on 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 Augustine and on Hillary. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there, there were sort of plenty, plenty Latin, uh, Latin authorities, but when it came to the sort of intricacies, intricacies of technical Christology, they really had to use um, John of Damascus, and so and so. It's actually that um, it's 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 sort of ironic that that uh, a period in Eastern um, theological development is is um, at the end of the day the most the one that's been most um, influential. Um, well, we could say ecumenically, or certainly in, in both Greek and Latin, uh, both Greek and Latin uh, traditions um, um, uh, in in later centuries. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And there's, I suppose it's no coincidence uh, for the Latin West that as they're reading Damascus, John of Damascus, uh, they're also rediscovering Aristotle as they're mm -hmm. getting into uh, some of these uh, uh, Christological um, discussions. Dr. Zakuber, um, before we wrap up, I, I want to ask you a, a broad question here. Um, something that, you know, uh, for whatever reason, still gets discussed today, 
uh, and I don't know why, uh, the long shadow of uh, Adolf von Harnack, maybe. Um, can we speak of this patristic philosophy? And if we do, do you see any great divide between their thought, the, the thought of the uh, early Christian philosophers and the biblical worldview? Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that's a I think that's a great question. And I actually, when I was thinking, you know, before how we could how we could start a conversation, I mean, it was obviously up to you. But I thought, you know, perhaps Hanak might have been a good a good place to to start from. I mean, it, it seems to me that kind of really two two questions. I think we need to keep keep separate. One is um, is the development of something like Christian philosophy sort of as such a problem? And I think Hanak, in a way, probably thought it was. Mm -hmm because he has um he has an idea that i think you know i don't i mean uh, it's 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 not it's not sort of obviously wrong he has he has an idea that there is a sort of idea there, there is a, there is a form of christianity that is is just is just sort of non philosophical that mm -hmm. is that is about the way people live that is about um the way people uh, conduct their lives uh, um, as as disciples of Jesus, and that the sort of superstructure of a highly complex of highly complex doctrines or theories, etc. You know that, that that is that that is something that perhaps historically had to happen, mm -hmm. um, but it is also it is also a problem because in some ways it um, it, it 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 distracts people from uh, from what's in scripture. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I actually think it's a legitimate question, mm -hmm. um, and the and the problem is definitely there. So, for example, quite a few of the people that that I'm discussing in my book, you think you know they can write hundreds of pages about Christology, and um, Scripture doesn't seem to play any role for that any right. longer. Very different from someone like Origen, for example, or someone like Athanasius. You know, for these kind of earlier patristics, where it's still um, where it's still sort of very rounded in 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 the in the Bible. So I think the question that the problem is definitely there. But anyway, so that's that's kind of one one question. And I think Hanak, I think Hanak's kind of, I mean, is is one of a perhaps relatively small number of people to think that we should we ideally we'd have a we'd have a sort of practical Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um, where where these speculative questions don't don't play a role. I think there's a separate question, and of course Hanak too uh, discusses that, which is you know the sort of Platonism of the Church yes. Fathers. The, yes. I mean Hanak's term is Hellenization, and I think because that suggests it's not just the growth of theory, it's not just the growth of philosophy, it's not just the growth of speculation within Christianity, but it's also you know, it's 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 a kind of illegitimate influence of for, sort of foreign ideas of kind of corrupt ideas it, of, in of, sort of incompatible with Christianity, and I think on that count, I personally really disagree, and I think that what I what I'm trying to show is that the kind of philosophy that rose among Christian authors from the fourth century in particular. Um, um, is it some ways kind of genuinely Christian, um, mm -hmm. and it is developed not in order to to sort of imitate a, a Platonism or or the Aristotelian tradition, but it is really an intellectual framework that is developed from genuine Christian doctrines mm -hmm. um, to to support these doctrines, to explain how, how they can be understood, to show how they cohere with each other, and so on and so forth. So I think that what I would want to say is, yes, there is that what we find is, 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 a, is, is an intellectual, is a philosophical tradition within Christianity that develops into, uh, into a quite, I would say, impressive form over the centuries. Um, could Christianity exist without that? Um, it's an interesting question. I think it's a legitimate question. Um, but is that simply evidence that Christians kept borrowing, borrowing, borrowing? Um, I would I would say the answer to that's actually no. Yeah. But it but but what I find there and what I find very interesting is that kind of alternative 
form of philosophy um, emerges. And that's, I mean, that's the title of the book, right? It's yeah. the rise, the rise of Christian theology in a way brings about an end or at least a crisis of some fundamental premises or foundations of, of classical Greek uh, metaphysical ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the first things I learned as a master's student in theology was this principle of um, lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, so the sense that the law of believing, uh, mm -hmm. lex credendi, has to conform somehow with the law of praying. So you get the sense that the church's worship, the liturgy informs its theology, but the Bible doesn't really help answer all of those questions. It doesn't necessarily provide the conceptual framework mm. for understanding how these things work. And then you get these thinkers like Origen, Clement of Alexandria, the Cappadocians, who are classically trained individuals who were raised reading these texts from Plato and Aristotle, and they knew the Stoics. And they found a conceptual framework for understanding that in these texts. So I, I do agree that while we don't see terms like hypostasis or usia, you know, articulated in scripture, scripture leaves those questions kind of unanswered in a way that those concepts do help. Um, I, I think... That's probably the best way I could understand it. I mean, I I hadn't really thought about um, how this Christian theology brings about the end of the, the this ancient metaphysics, as you read out in your book, which is quite fascinating, actually. And you could see how that would happen as uh, the debate shifts from Trinity and understanding the relationship between Father and Son to how we have to understand these two natures within the incarnate Christ. It's quite fascinating, actually. And this book, um, and I'll give you the last word, but this book really kind of unfolds how that how that drama takes place. So uh, I thank you for providing this uh, really wonderful uh, examination of, of how that how that process happened. Well, thanks. Thanks for letting me talk about it. I mean, I'm 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 conscious that uh, that I explore some really rather obscure corners of 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 um patristic doctrinal history, but in a, but but I I would totally agree with what you said in that. I I mean, you know, I've been I've been surprised um about the level of of sort of intricacy, the level of um. I don't know relevance of stuff that I've discovered in some of these authors who are often. Uh, neglected, and I'm I'm uh, happy, or I've been very happy to to sh to share some of these insights that I've I've had for myself uh, with with my readers. Well, thank you very much. I think this was a wonderful conversation, and I hope our viewers enjoy it just as much as uh, I have. Dr. Zakuber, thank uh, you thank for you. Uh, joining Patristicast today. Thank thanks thanks for having me, John. It was it was a great pleasure. You bet. And let's hope for some sunshine and warm weather pretty soon, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, we deserve that. Bye-bye.